schedule online, anytime. Now you can easily schedule an appointment with Ascension Care Teams at Seton. Find your appointment online, anytime at GetSetonCare.com. Knowing is the first step. Knowing is confidence. Helping everyone make more informed decisions. Quest Diagnostics. Good health starts with knowing. A new level of ambition and excellence thrives at the Texas Tech System. A $2 billion higher education enterprise with four diverse and distinguished universities. Because from here, it's possible. Okay, my mic is on, I think. Can you all hear me? Okay, my mic is on, so I'm assuming I'm allowed to start. No one's saying, I'm allowed to start, I'm good. <laughs> Welcome, y'all. My name is Marissa Evans. I'm the Health and Human Services Policy Reporter with the Texas Tribune in Austin. And on behalf of the Tribune, welcome to Transforming Public Health Care. I'm delighted to welcome you all. So it's our eighth annual trip fest, so I hope you've been enjoying yourself. Um, this panel is represented by, or presented by Ascension Seton and supported by Quest Diagnostics and Del Deloitte. Though corporate sponsors and donors underwrite this event, they play no role in determining the panel's content, panelists, or line of questioning. Um, the panel will be 60 minutes, and that will include about 15 to 20 minutes of Q&A. Uh, there, there are clearly microphones in the audience, so you all can line up, and we'll just go back and forth. Um, so our panelists today, very esteemed panelists, by the way. Uh, right next to me, Dr. Karen DeSalvo, a professor of medicine and population health at the University of Texas at Austin Dell Medical School, previously Assistant Secretary for Health and National Coordinator for Health Information Technology at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, we have Representative Garnett Coleman, a Democrat from Houston who has represented House District 147 since 1992 and serves as Chairman of the House County Affairs Committee and sits on the Public Health Committee. Next to him, Ovik Roy, founder of the Foundation for Research on Equal Opportunity, a think tank devoted to expanding economic opportunity to low-income individuals. Previously, he worked as a policy advisor for three presidential candidates, Florida Senator Marco Rubio, former Texas Governor Rick Perry, and former Massachusetts Governor Mitt Romney. Next to him, we have Stephanie Muth, Stephanie Muth who has served as State Medicaid Director for the Texas Health and Human Services Commission since 2017 and has spent 13 years as a commission, including as Deputy Executive Commissioner for Transformation and Deputy Executive Commissioner of the Office of Social Services. And last but not least, Representative Ford Price, Republican from Amarillo, who has represented House District 87 since 2010 and serves as Chairman of the House Public Health Committee, where he oversees ma matters pertaining to mental health programs and Chairman of the House Select Committee on Opioid and Substance Abuse. And of course, he's also running for Speaker of the House. I, w I didn't forget that. <laughs> um, thank you so much, y'all, for coming. I think I'm going to start with my softball question, or what I think is a softball question. What's the most important public health issue in Texas's future that keeps you up at night? Oh, no, you, you're right here. Right here, right here. Right here. Well, um, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, good morning, everybody. And, and I, I guess what I would say is, um, there's probably a, a, a similar issue in Texas as there is all over the country, which is that we haven't quite found a good balance between how much we're spending and the outcomes that we're getting. And so part of that is not so much that we need to spend more, but we need to be more smart about, about how we spend the money. And, and that includes uh, thinking about the way we pay the system to encourage it to be more centered around the person and their needs and values and thinking about the outcomes that we get from care, but also thinking about the total person and not just only their physical or even their mental health, but really all of the, the social determinants of the, their life and where they live it, because that drives 
not only their cost, but it, it drives their health outcomes. I, I, I think that's right. Uh, <laughs> you know, clearly access to health care uh, is extremely important and affordability. But I think we've already, we already know that, that we can reduce the cost by changing the way uh, we deal with preventative uh, health and population uh, public health and self. And the more we keep people healthy, the less we have to treat them. Uh, and and, I, and I, I do believe we're in fits and starts with that. Uh, some of it uh, obviously falls within the Affordable Care Act purview, pur purview, but also it falls within what we're paying for, not more money, but are we paying for things that actually reduce uh, the need for uh, physical health care to go in and see a doctor or go into mm -hmm. a hospital. So uh, that's what I worry about, whether we'll ever get there. Mm -hmm. So I agree with a lot of what has been said already, but I, I'll disagree with one thing, which is that uh, if we stay healthier over time, health care can actually become more expensive. That seems counterintuitive, but think about it this way. We all have to die of something. We're all going to die someday. And so if we live to 120, we're still going to die of something. And so a lot of what's happened in our health care system, and this is tr not tr just true in America, but true around the world, is that the longer we live, the more expensive healthcare becomes because we're living with long-term disabilities, say hip injuries, knee injuries, someone has a stroke or someone has cancer, but they're still living because of medical innovation. And so we're keeping them alive for longer and say that, that person then develops Alzheimer's, right? So a, a big part of the challenge, particularly as we, as we go in the next couple of decades and think about this as a future-oriented problem, is not just the fiscal aspect of it, which continues to be a problem, the growth of healthcare spending, it's straining our budget here in Texas and, of course, in the country overall, and that's going to continue to get worse. But as our population gets older, because we're successful at keeping people healthy for longer, I worry that that actually makes our health, the cost burdens of our health care system even worse and more challenging. I think as the state Medicaid director, it will surprise no one that what keeps me up at night is worrying about the sustainability of the Medicaid program um, <laughs> over time and into the future, how we make sure that we uh, drive good outcomes and maintain value in the Medicaid program. Wow, batting cleanup on that question is tough <laughs> because I don't really disagree with any of the comments that, that I heard, it, all valuable and, and certainly valid. The, uh, the thing that, that is interesting about public health and the issues related to public health is that they shouldn't be viewed in just a vacuum. So for instance, this interim, we've studied a lot of uh, issues related to substance use disorders. Those um, affect CPS, for instance. We, we determined or we heard testimony that that's the largest um, factor in, in kids entering our foster care system uh, today in Texas is substance use disorder. So when we talk about behavioral health and we talk about, uh, you know, the incorporation of, of mental health and physical health, um, substance use disorders, um, all these things, uh, there's just a broad uh, set of topics that are touched and affected by what we tend to think of as public health. And so uh, just wrapping our arms about that and being proactive instead of reactive, we do a pretty good job at the legislature being reactive, not always not always, uh, you know, as timely as we need to be, convincing colleagues sometimes that investments today will pay dividends eight years down the road is a very difficult thing to do. Everybody likes to see uh, results within their election time frame, so immediately or next year. So while we do need to measure those outcomes, uh, I think the thing that's really challenging, in addition to access and, and uh, coverage and just the things that we deal with all the time is, is thinking as our, our state's going to grow, um, and we're going to have challenges with, with all sorts of demands due to a growing population, uh, things like that need to be considered because uh, public health does touch and affect so many different areas. I think that's a, a challenge that we all have to grapple with. Okay, okay. Good answers all around. So keeping all of what y'all just said in mind, where has Texas, ha where has Texas missed an opportunity to tackle some of these very issues all of you just talked about, Representative Price. Where have we missed some opportunity? Mm -hmm. um, and well, how do we get back on track? Yeah, the the I guess one of the opportunities that I don't know if that's me or someone else. Uh, one of the opportunities I think that we've we probably uh, 
missed is in this area that we're catching up with, which, which is uh, in the area of behavioral health. Mm -hmm. We are making tremendous ad advancements at the state level. We're actually, and, and recently, Congress has passed some very important opioid legislation that, that will help us be able to leverage and not duplicate some efforts, leverage those resources, uh, better integrate maybe an infusion of federal dollars into an area that, that we can uh, better make progress in, in in the state. But, you know, we have seen sort of, I, I wouldn't say a neglect, but just a, it, it's been hard um, for, for the state uh, in the past. Uh, Chairman Coleman's done a tremendous job over the years being a leader for uh, behavioral health, and, and we've worked, uh, Speaker Strauss appointed that select committee back in 2015 on mental health. Um, the public health committees uh, actually spent a lot of time trying to incorporate and integrate better legislation with regard to uh, community collaboratives and things of that nature. I'm really proud of what we have done, but I think that we've missed some opportunities in the past and we're playing catch up. But there is a growing recognition that uh, the more we're doing now will we'll benefit the state down the road, and I think uh, we can't let our foot off the gas in that regard. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't say that this is an opportunity that we've missed, but I would say that this is an opportunity that we're early on the journey on, which is to transform the way that we pay for services in the Medicaid program and really focus on um, payment reform, paying for quality and outcomes and, and health outcomes. And we've started down that path, and I think this is one of the areas where actually Medicaid across the country is leading that effort, even over private insurers. Um, so for the first time in our managed care contracts this year, we have targets that they're um, expected to make about the percentage of value-based payment and, and a percentage of those that are at risk. But it's, it's definitely a journey. There's um, significant impact to providers from entering into these arrangements. And so it, it's a transformation that the system will continue to go in and tweak um, over the coming years. 50% of the, or roughly 50% of the Texas population lives in metropolitan areas and the other half lives in rural areas. And one of the big challenges in rural areas, of course, is access in particular to primary care. One innovative solution to that is telemedicine, allowing people to communicate with their doctors through video conferencing, Skype, FaceTime, things like that. The Texas Medical Board has aggressively fought efforts by local companies and other companies to uh, bring that innovation to people, particularly in rural areas. And I think that's an area where there's been a lot of litigation that's now at the federal level actually around this challenge that's, that's generally tend to be more favorable to patients, I think. But I, I would love to see the Texas Medical Board take a, a different approach and a different philosophy towards telemedicine. Instead of seeing it as a threat to their business model as physicians and competition, see it as something that really does a lot for particularly rural patients. Well, that goes back to access. <laughs> because uh, what uh, telemedicine about is, is about access. And I think one of the issues for people with, su with uh, uh, substance abuse uh, disorder and, and also with uh, any other types of behavioral health is about access. Again, because if you don't have coverage, then it's very difficult to get care. And that means that it becomes a general revenue proposition uh, for the state of Texas, uh, and particularly when it comes to who can be covered under Medicaid. Mm -hmm. But I believe that, as Four has said, with the work that he's done and the work that the, uh, the two different select committees, one on mental health and one on substance use disorder, it is increasing access. But where we've missed, missed it totally, and when the affordable, uh, when the 1115 waiver ends, we won't have the ability to come up with those funds in order to serve those folks. And we'll have to truly look at whether we're going to do some kind of uh, coverage expansion because that's what's going to pay for it. Yeah. Or we'll have to find another way to pay for it, partnering with our, uh, being partners with the federal government. Uh, right now we're getting funds that are granted funds, uh, but that doesn't necessarily follow the patient. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a way to do that. Uh, and we have to figure it out before we lose those billions of dollars uh, a year that we get through the 1115 transformation waiver. But I believe we've, we're making the right, taking the right path. It's just that it's not per patient, mm -hmm. uh, and that's something that we still need to accomplish. So I'm going to put on my doctor hat okay. and um, and um, lift up what each of them said because they actually all really matter in the clinical environment, especially the primary care environment. You know, when I 
um, uh, see patients. Um, I've had the ex experience of being paid um, for doing more versus being paid for doing better. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you as a, as a primary care doctor in particular, that experience of being rewarded for more person-centered care, for better outcomes, is so much more joyful than being worried about how many people I can see in a day. Um, it also drives those kinds of flexible outcomes payment models drove us to build teams where my skills were a part of a team as a doctor, but we were able to put into the clinical environment social work and legal aid services and mm -hmm. community health workers and, and, and behavioral health services as well so that the, the, the total needs of, of my patient could be met, not just managing their diabetes with them, but any other issues that, that might arise so that opportunity from having more flexible or value-based payment or alternative payment models, we call it lots of different things, I think is uh, helps to drive a lot of the um, opportunity for us to, to really do better by our patients and frankly, to make the practice of medicine um, a lot more joyful. So I don't think we've missed that in Texas. I think Stephanie's right, we're moving in that direction, but it would the more we can also do that, not just through Medicaid, but all payer, mm -hmm. so Medicare mm -hmm. and private mm -hmm. insurance so that when you're a doctor, you're pay being paid with a set of incentives that really drive you towards value and, and outcomes. And I think this um, other uh, two pieces that I really have to mention, one is about data. Again, Texas has not missed this, though we might have slowed up a little bit, I would say, in terms of technology supports for, for care. It's not just about telehealth, but about the way we're using data to really see the emerging threats to the public's health. And, it, and again, not just on Texas, but on the U.S., we kind of missed the opioid epidemic because we weren't really looking at timely data. It was pretty stale. And Texas, I think, um, is in a really good position to do better at some of that surveillance, that surveillance work. And the last thing I want to say is about, is about coverage. Because um, having practiced medicine for 25 years in Louisiana, where my patients were uninsured uh, predominantly, until we got a waiver that provided coverage um, for, it, for them to go to a set of clinics and then eventually expanded coverage. And I'll, I think the, the sense of relief for knowing that my patients uh, had a way to not only have access to the diagnostic test or to the, the, the um, medications that they needed or even routine preventive stuff, the, the relief for me isn't as great as it is for them, but as a doctor, we always worried about that. And I think the other part of it that we saw very clearly was that when patients had a way to pay for their care, it created competition in the system. Mm -hmm. It caused all of us to have to step up our game because we weren't being on a, we were not on a global budget. They didn't have to come to us. Um, and it, it caused the market to have to really make the systems more person-centered, more accessible, more customer-oriented, and I think that that's a good thing overall. Okay. That was good. That was great. School right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I wanted to do one follow-up question with you though. So, as a doctor, as someone who saw, saw patients in Louisiana, um, I don't know, are you seeing patients here right I'm now? Not. You're not. Okay, so in Louisiana, um, you know, and as you think about Texas and you've moved here and you're studying what's happening here, who would you say is being left behind right now in our healthcare system? It depends on uh, on what you mean by left behind. So when you look at data um, across. The, the America, mm -hmm. life expectancy overall is declining for the first time in generations. So we all ought to just know that. Um, we are still the greatest country on the planet, but all of a sudden, what used to be every year we get that live longer and longer is now beginning to drop off for two mm -hmm. years in a row. And when you dig into that data, it's um, there are definite gaps by color of your skin, by your insurance status, but also by where you live, by your zip code, affects your health outcomes. And that's a, that's a marker of public safety in your community or access to clean air or healthy food. So uh, there are uh, plenty of ways we can slice and dice the, the data to show that there is inequity, essentially. So I think um, uh, I want to also call out that it doesn't, sometimes uh, in, inequities or ch health or challenges or people getting left behind get, get lost in some of that data. So for example, um, Obik mentioned rural communities. This is where most of the increase in um, higher rates of disease and death are happening in this country. A lot of challenges around depression and hopelessness, suicide. So we've really got to figure out in, in, in Texas and beyond how we can do better by those, by those individuals living in rural communities and seniors. 10,000 uh, people uh, be, you know, be, becoming um, Medicare eligible every day sort of steps up the expectation nationally that we're going to have to make, make a system that's efficient. But uh, even in the everyday world today, 
a lot of, a lot of um, uh, older people are isolated mm -hmm. and uh, alone and don't have access to some of the stuff that we kind of take for granted. So it's not just necessarily some of the ways we've always mm -hmm. talked about disparities. There are some populations that are getting left behind that we have the means to help. We just have to really take a harder look at whether we've built the right system to support them. Um, Ovid's written extensively about the Affordable Care Act and how Congress can fix, what, fix it, repeal it, make it better. Um, but we're a year removed from those repeal efforts from last year because there's a lot going on in Washington right now. That's all I'll say. Um, in your most ideal world, thinking long term, what does the future of health insurance coverage look like? Well, the thing I've written a lot about, and, we've, and my think tank has published a lot of mm -hmm. stuff on this, is market-based universal coverage. So uh, having Explain something, with that. yeah, so yeah. think about the Obamacare exchanges, but with more choice, more competition, and lower prices. So one of the biggest challenges with the Obamacare exchanges is that the premiums have gone up every year because the way the Obamacare exchanges are set up is it's a, a relatively good deal if you're sicker and if you're older and if you're lo lower income to some degree because of the subsidies. But if you're generally healthy and if you're generally younger, the insurance plans and the Affordable Care Act are very expensive for you. Basically, they're a raw deal. And so a lot of those people just don't sign up. And because they don't sign up, there's this uh, spiral of cost where sick people sign up and the average cost becomes higher and the insurance goes up. So fixing that problem so that people can actually shop for their own. The general idea in the exchange is that you should shop for your own insurance, and if, you, if you're low income or you really have high medical bills, we'll help you with that through uh, taxpayer assistance, which is, I think makes perfect sense. But there's some subtleties to the way those insurance markets are designed that isn't working well. So fix that, and then actually use that as the chassis or the model for expanding coverage to everyone. Because, for example, the challenge with our Medicaid system is because it's jointly funded by the federal government and the states, mm -hmm. it creates all these problems of, you know, two CEOs is like having no CEOs, mm -hmm. right? It, the program can get mismanaged in a way because states want more flexibility, the federal government doesn't mm -hmm. give them. Low-income people, their income goes up and down. One month you're on Medicaid, the next month you're on the exchange, the next month you might be on an employer-based system. And so you're having to change who your primary care doctor is every month to month. So a lot of what I've talked about when it comes to coverage mm -hmm is trying to have a more integrated system in which you sign up for insurance and maybe the level of your financial assistance goes up and down based on your life circumstances, but you don't have to get kicked off of your plan because your income goes up and down one month to the next month. So that's a big part of what I've talked about. And broadly speaking, and this is something that relates to Texas, mm -hmm. we enjoy a relatively low cost of living in Texas. We're, we often you'll hear uh, people in, in Austin and the government talk about that, right? We're, we're a great state in that way, a high growth state, low taxes, low cost of living, it's a place that people want to live. But health insurance in Texas is not actually that cheap, surprisingly, given how low the cost of living is in Texas. And a big part of the problem there is regional hospital monopolies, which take advantage of their market power to charge really high prices. I hope there aren't any big hospital systems that are <laughs> sponsoring this conference, but so I won't mention any by name. No, but, uh, but, uh, but, but there are, uh, those of you who live, whether you live here or you live in other places where there's like one big mm -hmm. hospital system that basically owns all the hospitals in that mm -hmm. part, of, part of the state or part of the country, they take advantage of that to say, you know what, if you're an insurance company, you know, insurance companies, what they try to do is say, if you're going to charge $15,000 for knee replacement and hospital B charges $5,000 for knee replacement, I'm going to try to steer patients to hospital B. But if one hospital system owns all the hospitals in that part of the country or part of that state, the insurers don't have that leverage. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a problem that Texas as a state, state government, can do something about. The Texas, Texas can launch anti or pro-competitive mm -hmm. measures is to try to break up those hospital monopolies and create more competition among providers. And Texas has been relatively passive about that. And a big right. part of the challenge there is this regional hospital systems have gotten so big that they're like one of the they're like the number one employer in that mm -hmm. part of the state. And mm -hmm. so every people in the legislature are afraid, well, well wow, if I if I you know take on this hospital, that's a lot of jobs that, that will be disrupted by that. So it's a big problem, and I think a lot of times we've ignored it because most of these hospital systems are nonprofit, and so we just say, well, they're nonprofit, so they must be good, right? And that's not the truth at all. A lot of times, nonprofit uh, monopolies can be the most dangerous kind because we tend to put a halo on their head because they're nonprofit and not see how they actually are, are exploiting the system. So okay. that, I think, is a big challenge about affordability that mm -hmm. we've got to tackle in this state. Okay. Um, you mentioned a little bit of Medicaid. 
Mm -hmm. I'm going to jump over to Stephanie right there. Um, you know, Medicaid is a big chunk of the Texas budget. I think every year there's this, every session there seems to be this, uh, oh, right, Medicaid. We have to fund that. Um, it's a $62.4 billion budget for the 2018-2019 cycle, if I'm correct. Um, but there are still challenges in terms of taking care of people with diabetes, maternal care, heart disease, mental health, substance abuse, the list goes on and on and on. Um, and people are still not where they need to be in terms of their health outcomes. So given the size of that budget, you know, how do we reconcile the cost of Medicaid with the outcomes that we're seeing right now? So I, I think there's um, some misperceptions right, about say. cost yeah, of okay. Medicaid. Yeah. Um, if, if you actually look at the cost growth in the Medicaid program over time, um, over the last five years, our per person cost growth has been at 1%. If you compare that to other states, um, or what we're seeing in healthcare overall, it's, that's incredible. Mm -hmm. The cost increases that we have seen have been more related to population growth mm -hmm. in, in the program. So, and we do have programs that incentivize value, and if you look at health outcomes in a number of areas from reducing preventable admissions or readmissions in hospitals, we're continuing to move that needle in the right direction. So I think that the Texas Medicaid program has a strong foundation for building on outcome focus um, at, at being, being very responsible about the use of the dollars that we have. Okay. Um, well, walk me through and walk the audience through who makes up Texas sure. Medicaid. Who, what, what services are they using? What, how do they usually get into the program? So um, if Texas Medicaid as a whole, I'll give a, a couple mm -hmm. of uh, fun facts about Texas Medicaid. <laughs> so we have about 4.5 million recipients across the state mm -hmm. of Texas. That's just, uh, just roughly about one in six Texans are receiving Texas Medicaid. But the vast majority of that, 77% are children mm -hmm. um, age, uh, under the age of 18. Uh, so um, when you look at who in addition to that, and I'm going to like use my cheat yep, sheet because numbers away. don't always stick in my head. <laughs> so um, we have about 17% of the overall population that's between 19 and 64, and 6% are 60, the age 65 and plus. Um, if you look at the Medicaid caseload, I think this is another thing that's often not understood. The, the population as a whole, only 7% of our caseload is comprised of non-disabled uh, non adults. So those would largely be pregnant women or people who qualify for the TANF program, um, so they're caretakers mm -hmm. with, with young children. 52% uh, of the births in Medicaid are paid mm -hmm. 52% of the births in Texas mm -hmm. are paid for <laughs> through the Medicaid program, and um, the average monthly enrollment that we have for pregnant women is about 140,000. But when you look at that, while the majority of the caseload is made up by children, the cost drivers are a little bit different. So about a quarter of that caseload is aged and disability related, but that quarter of the caseload makes up about 61% of the total cost. And I think, you know, when, when I, as I've had the privilege to serve as the Medicaid director and, and work with the various stakeholders, um, the, the thing about the services that we pro provide, particularly for the aged and disabled, um, the, they receive services like personal attendance mm -hmm. services, and those services allow individuals to be productive members of society. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's broader than just health services when they're receiving those long-term services and supports. Okay, great, great, thank you. Um, for the two legislators on the panel, so 86 legislative session is coming up, it's an exciting time, or it's supposed to be an exciting time, uh, in come January. Uh, you know, going into session, what are your, both of your priorities, and how are you going to make them happen? I will start with Representative Price. Well, certainly the, uh, the work that, that our committees have engaged in over this interim period, both on the public health side um, and on the um, opioid and substance abuse um, side, has been uh, quite significant. And we've had multiple hearings throughout the, the interim 
uh, to address all the charges that the speaker gave us. And so naturally a lot of the priorities that, that we have that I have personally and that, that I think uh, will result in recommendations is the work these two committees have actually been engaged in. Same here. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've covered, you know, as I mentioned, it's not just siloed into what some people will traditionally think is public health. I mean, we look at uh, how that affects, you know, first responders. We have reevaluated Good Samaritan mm -hmm. laws. We have looked at whether or not, you know, fentanyl and the problem it has on our first responders mm -hmm. and, and the dangers that that can, um, uh, produce, you know, needs more attention. We have looked at uh, certainly uh, the maternal mortality and morbidity task force work and what has contributed to some of the uh, uh, the issues that, have, that you have personally have reported on in the past and uh, what we can do to improve that situation. We've seen quite a bit of uh, challenges in, in the public health, you know, sector and, and so it's natural for us to prioritize that. It is along with um, other areas of health and human services spending, certainly uh, right there almost neck and neck with uh, Article Three spending, mm -hmm. which is public and higher education. And so naturally, as we go into our next session, the only bill that we have to pass is the budget. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, obviously education and healthcare will be the two drivers of the budget, and we will focus a lot of our policy decisions on how we can allocate our resources. Mm -hmm. What is the most effective and efficient way to stretch the dollars that we have? We're certainly going to be in a better position um, than I think we may have anticipated, uh, you know, a year ago, but it still won't totally feel like it because of, uh, you know, caseload growth, mm -hmm. cost growth, things that we need to put in our supplemental budget, Hurricane Harvey relief. Certainly, you know, that, mm -hmm. you know, uh, should not go unnoticed because there will be a lot of programs that I think uh, not only are necessary for the state to pay for, uh, I think you should expect legislators to tie every program and bill they want to Hurricane Harvey mm -hmm. in an effort to uh, try to leverage that um, maybe um, to, for, for pilot programs or other programs. So uh, certainly the budget will drive all the decisions that we make uh, mm -hmm. in many respects. I think that we will have high priorities uh, just as a body on public health, on uh, opioid substance abuse legislation, which will tie into that. Um, I think that we will see a tremendous emphasis on property tax and school mm -hmm. finance, um, certainly, and then uh, all the other areas of big state spending, you know, whether mm -hmm. it's transportation, criminal justice, natural resources, economic development, certainly all that will tie into it. So that's kind of where I would see a lot of the discussion uh, taking place. Okay. Um, actually, I, I, not actually, I agree with all of that. Um, you know, it's been an honor to work with four on these issues of uh, behavioral health, uh, substance use disorder, and uh, obviously mental health, mm -hmm. uh, and issues that go along with that, uh, postpartum depression, mm -hmm. the bills that were passed last session uh, by Sarah Davis, the bill passed mm -hmm. by Sarah Davis, the, the, the issues of whether or not a child with cerebral palsy uh, can get uh, the cannabinoid oil mm -hmm. so that they don't die from uh, or have severe damage from from um, from seizures uh, and I agree with Stephanie uh, very clearly that Medicaid is a bigger program than mm -hmm. people think it is and it mm -hmm. has a lot of value what I would hope we would do and this goes back to uh, to add to those things that that uh, Forrest talked about and I look forward to working closely with them next session on, on those issues as we did at this session, because that's a, that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. And Texas Texans, and Texas ought to be proud of what we've done, of what uh, the speaker it engaged us to do, uh, because in a lot of other states, after Sandy Hook, they just said, okay, we did one session with this, and we're not gonna do it anymore. Mm -hmm. We didn't stop. And the worst thing that could happen next session is that the progress that we've made gets rolled back on, or that we don't do more. And the most important thing is that we build on what's our, what the bills that were passed last session by Chairman Price and things, things that we have done uh, to, to make the lives better for people who, you know, it doesn't, doesn't matter their income. No one asks to be on drugs and no one asks to be mentally ill or be both, mm -hmm. uh, which seems, seems to be the case. People who don't have coverage because of gaps in the system, I think, become really important. I started working on these things about uh, two decades ago, mm -hmm. and there was a category of people who, were, uh, who are adults 
that we call the near elderly. I hadn't heard that term in a while. Mm -hmm. So these are the people who are not eligible for Medicaid because they're mm -hmm. elderly. They're not eligible for Medicare. Generally, the majority of that population are women, mm -hmm. uh, and they are either uh, divorced uh, and have, have no way of getting health coverage or even through em their employer. Uh, this is a very difficult thing for people uh, across the state and particularly in rural areas. Mm -hmm. And I want to bring rural areas back mm -hmm. because we can make some more progress on that. Mm -hmm. and, and we will. The technology side of life, when we looked at rural regional collaboratives for, uh, for mental health and substance use disorder, I mean, the reality is that the providers aren't there. And right. that's what Four and I have heard mm -hmm. in our substance use disorder uh, select committee and that he chairs is that, you know, every time we look at anything, the challenge is exacerbated in rural areas. Mm -hmm. But when we look at where people don't have the ability to see a doctor and mm -hmm. they aren't even eligible for our indigent care in the state, that's the real problem of dri sometimes of driving costs. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. I think that there are some monopolies in, uh, in health hospital systems, but we created that. Mm -hmm. We created that because uh, in order for hospitals to survive, they had in systems, they had to get bigger. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the same applies to physicians. In order mm -hmm. for them to survive, they had to get bigger. So we have statewide uh, a, a care, whether it's a primary care provider group, uh, an anesthesia group, or, uh, uh, a group that is uh, uh, that does deals with cancer, I can name mm -hmm. them for yep. you, yep. But, but that's defensive uh, mm -hmm. because of the reduction in cost. What we don't have in Texas that they have in other places is uh, uh, review of rates. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have review of rates, they, that is what the open market gave us. It gave us how do I defend against being paid less than I need to get paid in order to, uh, in order to survive in, in whatever profession. So I, I think that, that the best way to reduce costs is to, you know, and, and mm -hmm. make these systems, all right. of these systems work, uh, is to have less need. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a long time ago, I'm showing my age, mm -hmm. a long time ago when we talked about uh, substance abuse, there were two ways of talking about it. Mm -hmm. uh, it was talking about the war on drugs. Uh, and so if you build, if you have war on drugs meant to secure the border, mm -hmm. where somebody might say, well, still today, the war on drugs really means demand reduction. Mm -hmm. So if we talk about demand reduction, that is actually a process right. that you do. And with manufactured drugs, mm -hmm. it's very different because those, every day we get a new drug, just change the compound. Mm -hmm. So all I'm going to say is when we look at all of this, these are all things that we really need to uh, continue to focus on. How we do it, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I know this, that if we don't do it, the cost and the harm is only compounded. And in order to make sure that people have an opportunity to access the care for whatever it is, mm -hmm. and that we diminish the need for the access to that care, is what we'll have to do in Medicaid, whether it's human services or whether mm -hmm. it's acute care, it's what we'll have to do across the board in substance abuse and uh, pregnancies right. in, in terms of preventing pregnancy. Mm -hmm. It's what we have to do uh, when it comes to our elderly and making sure that they have dignity, but also we can lessen the cost of caring for them. And, um, and that's where I think we need mm -hmm. to go next right. session. Mm -hmm. We need to continue to work on, on those aspects of, of our health care system. Mm -hmm. uh, it's difficult. Right. Uh, but the most important thing that has happened, I know, in the House and in the Senate and, and, uh, and over the last at least session or two sessions, is so guess what? We happen to be working together. And it's really yeah, how about it's that? How and then we that? actually agree that the problems are the problems <laughs> that need to be solved. And we actually agree that the, you hear no one going, no, we don't need to deal mm -hmm. with opioids. We don't need to, you know, we need to deal with these things. And that's a great start for a good future in next session. And if there's anything that we need to do is keep that ball rolling. Mm -hmm. Just before I get to my next question, um, start thinking about your questions. Uh, we'll be at the mic, so start thinking about your questions in the next few minutes. Um, 
for the other three panelists who are not legislators. Um, you know, we just heard them talk about what they're thinking about for next session. You know, are they on the right track? Is this, is this, are you happy with what you're hearing? Okay. Well, I, I think in terms of what the state can do, I outlined some aspects mm -hmm. of it in terms of the broader question of affordability, right? I think there's a lot that, that Texas isn't doing in terms of tackling, uh, allowing for more competition and therefore more price competition among hospitals, among physicians. These are things that the Texas legislature uh, could very much take on. Uh, I know that the Texas legislature, one thing it's working on is applying for a new Medicaid waiver. Right. Uh, and I hope that uh, in that process and, and the conversations I've had with members of the leg legislature about this topic, uh, that there is as much emphasis as possible at uh, identifying where it is that there are limitations in the way Medicaid is designed today that prevent Texas from serving its Medicaid population as well and as effectively as possible and as affordably as possible. Because I think you hear a conversation, particularly on the Republican side mm -hmm. in Texas, where people say, well, the Washington is just telling us what to do. There's all this micromanagement. Washington, just give us the money and let us manage it. We'll do it better than Washington. That's a great kind of bumper sticker. But what you rarely hear is what specifically are the specific challenges that federal law, whether it's regulatory law or statutory law, actually do to limit the ability of Texas to actually serve its populations in need. And what I'm hoping that we can have as a conversation over the next few months leading into the session is that conversation. Because um, if Texas wants to have more flexibility and more autonomy about how it manages those populations, uh, helping those in Washington know where the, where the problems are and where the limitations are will be very helpful in allowing Texas to use its scarce resources as, as affordably as possible, as effectively as possible. I'm going to step away from mm -hmm. Medicaid focus and mm -hmm. talk about public health mm -hmm. more broadly. And, and um, I think it's a, um, a really important uh, concept about the supply and demand. Mm -hmm. and, and you could focus on uh, opioids as, as, a, as an area of that, though we could apply the same concept to maternal child health mm -hmm. outcomes or chronic disease outcomes, meaning that Often our inclination is to focus on, and take opioids as an example, of supply of medical services to treat substance use disorder um, or cutting off the supply of prescribed opioids. These are all very important act actions that uh, Texas has been taking, and I, I applaud that. I think um, at Del Med we've been mm -hmm. involved in helping to educate um, physicians and other prescribers about the importance of pres you know, prescription drug monitoring programs, et cetera. But that's the supply side, and, and there's a, a, an additional supply, which is illicit drugs, that always keeps cropping up when you when you uh, cut that off. But the demand right. component, the yeah, the com demand component is why why beyond just getting prescribed uh, opioids postoperatively or for for some acute pain, um, are people self-medicating? And it's right. not just with opioids; it's with alcohol and with other substances, and that gets us back into this issue of having healthy communities, access to. Um, sort of all the opportunity that creates vital community. So this is not a legislative or a Medicaid issue, but really just to call out um, mm -hmm. how um, terrific uh, Texas has been doing in creating local models of community collaboration that involve the public and private sector to really begin to think about how do we have a vibrant community where everybody has an opportunity to be successful economically and otherwise. And I'll just, San Antonio is a great mm -hmm. example. They were recognized last week um, by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation with the Culture of Health Prize. They've received medals from the De Beaumont mm -hmm. Foundation the city government has for implementing policies around um, uh, smoking, for example, to keep kids from beginning to smoke and whatnot. So there are lots of things that don't require the legislature, no offense to, the, to these esteemed uh, gentlemen, uh, that, that can be done today and, and are being done in, a lot in, in communities across Texas. And so I hope that that work also yes. stays prime and, and focused because that's how we deal with the demand side of need. Mm -hmm. I think we've had a lot of focus today in the conversation about innovation and transformation mm -hmm. and where we're going in the future, but I also believe that, and that's very important, mm -hmm. but it's difficult to innovate or transform if you're not coming from a solid foundation. So one of the things that I um, wanted to comment mm -hmm. on and, and really think the, uh, our 
the legislators for their leadership as well as the governor's office for their leadership is recognizing the importance of continuing to strengthen the agency's ability to oversee managed care organizations. Yeah. Yeah. So 10 years ago, 60% of our population in Medicaid was served in managed care, and those were largely the children and pregnant women. Um, we've added more complex services, more complex populations in, into managed care over the last 10 years. Now it's 93%. And that does require the agency to really shift um, the way that we oversee the Medicaid program, and that is a transformation that we've been going through mm -hmm. over time. Um, but I think there's a significant, we've added some very significant efforts um, from very intensive monthly reviews of managed care organizations. We received a, a approval um, to transfer staff from one area of the agency to another, so I had a 10% increase in my staffing mm -hmm. levels just to strengthen that oversight, particularly from a clinical perspective, looking at service delivery to the most vulnerable um, populations that we serve. And at the end of the day, that's really what Medicaid is about. So I just wanted to, mm -hmm. to thank everybody for their support in that effort. Um, I think we've made significant strides. We have been making significant strides. Mm -hmm. You know, there's been focus in the past around we had to carve in these complex populations. We had to add this new service delivery line. And Medicaid is a very administratively complex program. We have five different product lines, 13 different service delivery areas, over 40 contracts. That is not an easy thing to uh, administer, and I appreciate the, the recognition and support that we've had that we have to have the solid foundation to continue to build from for the future. And if I may, when I came in the legislature in 1991 is when we started Medicaid Managed Care. Uh, and we started it with, uh, with pilots. Uh, and those pilots did several different things. Uh, you had the general uh, Medicaid Managed Care for children, basically, mm -hmm. uh, and the adults that were there but we had pilots for substance abuse and for uh, the care for the elderly, which now have been basically spread across the right. state, particularly disabled children as a part of that. This is tough, y'all. Mm -hmm. And, and I, 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 you all are doing a good job of being tough, but whenever you privatize something, if we want to have the appropriate oversight, you have to have the breadth and the depth of the staff in order to make sure that's done properly. And we've learned that over time. Right but we just substantially expanded the complexity of it, uh, which I think people may not, may not know, because it was only one county, Harris County, that was dealing with the disabled and the elderly and a managed care mm -hmm. system, and now it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and we had a semi-managed care system in the rural area. And I was telling Stephanie before we came in that, that you know, whatever I can do mm -hmm. to assist, I'm probably the only member other than Zaffarini <laughs> that was here when we did that. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was tough. Yeah. And when we added um, uh, CHIP, we ended up having a bunch of administrations, I'm going back to what you were talking about, and making sure that we had the appropriate number of mm -hmm. managed care organizations in the regions that actually provide uh, that that coverage, mm -hmm. but it is tough, and I think right. that what I'm happy to hear, I guess what I really want to say is I'm happy to hear is there's a recognition mm -hmm. that you can't have the tail wagging the dog, and if you don't have the folks there that can actually tell the uh, the tail what to do, then the the tail will continue to wag the dog, even w when you work in and together to do those things. Mm -hmm. And I think that th this is the best thing that I've heard, Stephanie. I'm I'm here to do whatever I can do to help you do that. Wonderful. Uh, we can go into Q and A. Just didn't know there's mics here and here. Okay, that's a lot of people. Okay, <laughs> we're gonna see what happens. This is good. Ask this short good. questions so we can get through them all. I'm not whatever, scared. Whatever. Uh, just a couple of things before we get into Q and A. I need a question, not a comment, not a campaign speech. You know, just keep it tight, keep it simple. There's a lot of y'all. I want to get to as many of you as possible. So, and I will interrupt if I don't hear a question. So, <laughs> politely, of course. No pressure. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jana Sims. I'm a resident of Austin, really, originally from East Texas. Um, uh, Representative Coleman, I want to thank you for the Sandra Bland Act and, and addressing mental health um, in the county jails. Um, 
And we're going to do more. We had a hearing uh, on Wednesday, and we're going to do more. I appreciate mm -hmm. that. I'm just curious if there's any way to on kind of, you know, build on top of that to uh, to make sure that we don't only guarantee 24-hour access or, or the use of, of telemental health in the county jails, but bring that into the communities and somehow find a way for the counties to fund the access with telemental health, maybe in libraries or schools, but a way for the public to access it outside of normal business hours, considering that a lot of people in rural communities maybe can't take time off during the business hours, particularly around subs or mental health, it being a stigma, they may mm -hmm. not want to. And, and gotcha. so how, mm -hmm. how can we bring mm -hmm. that into the community? Well, you just did. <laughs> um, and it goes with what you're saying in terms, the reason we were able to do the telemental health uh, that we couldn't do before in rural jails is because of Teladoc. It's because the technology caught up with everything that it can now be done on your cell phone and it doesn't take a T1 line and all of these different mm -hmm. things that allow that access. So anything that we've done under the Sandra Bland Act could be done under any community-based uh, system of mental health. Uh, in, in some cases, when we get better at it, uh, physical health. So I appreciate what you said that just went in my head. Car is here, she's writing that down because it is, it was the time, believe me, I was at a deal before the beginning of the, right at the beginning of the session, last session, and then that's when I was talking to somebody who was working with the Teladoc people and I said, okay, you gotta help me do this. Mm -hmm. and, and it was clear to me that we could now do it, that if we could do that all over the state, then we can do whatever it is we need to do, particularly because it's efficacious in in mental health. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm going to add to that real quick okay. uh, really because quick. I think what you're uh, stating is very significant, especially with telepsychiatry. It is right. probably mm -hmm. one of the most well-suited areas for telehealth applications mm -hmm. across the state. And what we have seen uh, last session, we did pass some, mm -hmm. some significant telemedicine legislation that really yes. broke down, you know, in the past the big barrier was not technology, it was the ability to get reimbursed by health insurance mm -hmm. providers for services that otherwise could be uh, performed in office, but you know if they were performed through an audiovisual connection or through store and forward technology, there was great reluctance to pay for those mm -hmm. services. So what we saw is that removed, and now the hope is more providers will be providing that, and the applications, which, whether it's in the criminal justice system, whether it's in a rural community, whether it's in a clinical setting or a non-traditional mm -hmm. setting, I mean I really think that uh, we have great opportunity. It's just now gaining some traction. So. I think we'll see more uh, of that to come, but I think uh, that application probably is more well suited to the use of that technology than almost any other. And we're seeing it with school safety and some of the things right. that we're, uh, with the Twitter mm -hmm. you know, program up in uh, the High Plains and South mm -hmm. Plains through the Texas Tech Health Science Center, things like that are really good. So I think we'll see more of it. So yeah. just, just so you know, and he, he, we all worked on this together, but it's big. Oh, uh, uh, I'm sorry. We want to make sure we get to the next question. So yes, go ahead. Quickly, I was just going to say that <laughs> we tested that. It wasn't as if it just we just said, oh, we're going to do mm -hmm. that. And it was done under the 1115 waiver. Just so you know. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Hi, my name is Gary Brown, and I'm from Austin. Um, there are many rural hospitals that continue to close, and many of them are even more on the edge of closing. What can the state do um, to stem that tide? And it seems, well, first I think we need to take the Medicaid expansion. But the second thing is, mm -hmm. um, we have some of the best medical centers in the country in this state. Can they be of help in that endeavor? Thank you. Sometimes uh, the, the best medical centers in terms of the ones that are the most prestigious are part of the problem because they're the big high cost centers that are driving the rural hospitals out of business. So that's a big part of the problem, is that we assign them all this prestige because MD Anderson, oh, it's so wonderful, uh, and we don't pay attention to some of the pricing practices and the, and the, kind of the, and the things that are actually causing a lot of the problems with hospital or competition and consolidation. So that's problem number one. Uh, problem number two is that there are a lot of regulations, some of which are at the federal level, but some are at the state level. That, that require hospitals be, to be structured in a certain way. So for example, as the population becomes more metropolitan and less rural, uh, the hospital isn't allowed to have the flexibility to say, for example, shrink its emergency department, which is the highest cost element of any particular hospital, or do other things to, to, to reduce the size of its physical plant or the way it staffs. 
So part of the challenge is that you've got this hospital that's required to have a certain structure and a certain staffing system that can be very costly even if the population in that rural area changes. So there's a lot at the legislative level here in Texas and also in the Medicare program that can, you can do to try to change that. But generally speaking, that's not the conversation we have. The conversation we have generally tends around, we have to bail out that hospital. We have to throw more taxpayer money at it. Instead of actually trying to identify what are the restrictions that prevent that hospital from adapting to changing circumstances. We're doing more procedures out of a, a hospital setting, right? So like I had a surgery on my Achilles tendon the other day. I, I was in and out in one day. That's not something that has to be done in a hospital. It can be done in a standalone uh, uh, freestanding agency or freestanding clinic. That's one of the reasons why hospital admissions have gone down, and hospitals still have those fixed costs, but they're not getting the revenue because innovation is allowing a lot of things to happen outside the hospital. So we have to make sure that hospitals have the tools to adapt to this innovative world in which fewer and fewer things are being done in a hospital. Did you want to win? Okay. Okay. Hi, my name is Victor Falcone, and I'm a native Austinite. What is your opinion on the importation of drugs, um, prescription drugs from other countries, and should we instate that here in Texas or nationally? Uh, you're looking at me, so I assume you're, you're asking like me. Anybody, like anybody, really okay. anybody on the stage. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take that question because I've actually written about this at, at, our found, uh, at our foundation, the Foundation for Research on Equal Opportunity. And so if you're interested, you can go to our website. It's freeop.org, F-R-E-O-P-P.org, and look at this report called the Competition Prescription, which is all about this. And the short answer is yes. Uh, there are things we ought to do to uh, import drugs from other countries, excuse me, um, and uh, particularly in areas where you have a, 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 an, a, an off-patent drug, a drug that has been around for a long time where there's no patent, but there's effectively a monopoly because the FDA has not allowed for competitors to come on the market. In situations like that, sometimes manufacturers have exploited that monopoly opportunity to jack up prices, and those are uh, situations where importing drugs from another country can be useful. And uh, HHS, the, the Trump administration, is actually looking into that. So that is something that is in the conversation right now. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. My name is Allison Sturgeon, and I live in Tyler, Texas. I work for DHSS uh, Region 4, 5 North in infectious disease in the TB, HIV, STD mm -hmm. branch. And um, in the last, well, first of all, we're having um, marked increases in TB cases. Mm -hmm. And since I've been there, up by 40% active cases, not LTBI. Mm -hmm. And we also have increases significant in gonorrhea and syphilis cases with mm -hmm. no corresponding increase in our budget. In fact, we had an 11% de decrease um, in the 85th legislative session, which resulted in mm -hmm. loss of staff positions. So we're already doing more with less. And um, we're dreading January 8th, and we're going to be holding our breath until May 27th. The question is, are we going to have to prepare for even more loss, even more budget cuts in the next session? And I'm not specifically addressing the legislators, since as a state employee, I'm not allowed to lobby. Never. <laughs> <laughs> let, let, me, let me grab that um, and um, reflect that, first of all, thank you for raising public health what I would call public health version 1.0 issues, meaning that's the early days of what public health did to extend life expectancy to protect us from communicable disease with clean water and flush toilets, but also protecting us from, from scourges like tuberculosis, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're seeing across the country a resurgence of infectious disease. It's not just in Texas. And in the public health community, um, there's been a broad concern. It, it, it's related to an, an, a chronic underfunding of the core public health infrastructure. I don't mean Medicaid or clinics. I mean true epidemiologists like yourself who can uh, find out where, 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 where outbreaks are occurring and get in the middle of it to protect um, people. These are not things, by the way, that affect just one person because they're communicable diseases. When one person has them, they're easily transmitted. So. Um, you're uh, unfortunately a part of a, a broader issue we're having across the U.S. that the CDC and others have been speaking about more and the need to make sure we're, we're funding the fundamentals of, of the way that we've kept uh, people healthy and alive in this country. And I'll just add real quick to that. Um, first of all, thank you for your uh, service to the state and the citizens of the state. We appreciate it. I know that the... Uh, the transformation with uh, that's been going on since the 84 session um, with the passage of 
SB 200 and some of the bills that, that you know, the sun, that were the result of the Sunset Advisory Commission's work. Uh, the one thing that I think is, is most beneficial from that is actually the Department of State Health Services getting uh, its focus, its core mission of improving public health and getting some of the regulatory and uh, just um, other issues. It had been a catch-all department for a number of years. And so to be able to focus on its core mission of improving public health, I think, is a step in the right direction. So I know there have been some staffing changes. There have been some readjustments in the budget due to that transformation. Um, and, and certainly uh, I would not expect uh, the uh, the funding to go down with res with regard to the specific issues you talked about because a lot of the decisions that will be made especially in article 2 will be data driven and so these are alarming numbers that you're talking about and and there's bigger issues at play we have you know immunization uh, discussions probably more frequently today than we've had in the recent past at least since I've been here um, as to whether or not you know, it should become easier not to uh, have your children immunized, for instance, and, and vaccines, and and uh, that that creates a whole other set of public health issues that you referenced. So, uh, I guess the short answer to your question is, I would expect there to be a lot of focus on that. Um, I think the, the the sort of transformation and refocus on on improving public health in the department has been a very positive thing. This is going to have to be your last Okay, question. I'll try to be super quick. Be super quick. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Maybe we can talk after. Yes, um, yes, you can. Um, I'm a reporter covering a rural area, Washington County, um, and just my research, I've seen um, a, a deficit of resources, a deficit, deficit of funding, and it seems like um, more, and more and more often as pe people pull this funding, the onus has been on local law enforcement um, taxpayers um, to perform, mostly law enforcement, to perform duties that they shouldn't necessarily be, like, responsible for. Um, I, I guess my question is, are there any plans to address these specific needs in rural communities? It, it seems like it's, you're, you're identifying a problem without providing a solution necessarily um, so to, to address these people before they, it's escalated and they enter the criminal justice system. Okay, okay. If, so if uh, I would direct you to the tape uh, of the County Affairs Committee hearings both on this mm -hmm. past Tuesday and Wednesday. And there was a robust discussion on that with sheriffs okay. uh, and with other public health related and this relates to substance use disorder, mental health, mm -hmm. and the use of law enforcement as the mechanism to deal with it and the solutions that we talked about. Okay. Cool. And I only do that because we don't have time. Okay. Can I address y'all later? Yeah. Oh, Thank you so Go much. Sure. Well, we are out of time, but thank you to everybody who came. Great, great questions. Thanks for your panel.